Okay, Jean, are you ready? Yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, so I'm happy to introduce uh, our second speaker for the day, Jean Profilet. Uh, Jean recently graduated uh, with a PhD in OR from MIT, where he worked with uh, Professor Dimitris Bertsimas. Um, Jean's research interests are primarily in large scale uh, discrete optimization and uh, connections with machine learning. Uh, and he's, uh, he's worked on applications uh, primarily in healthcare. Um, uh, and uh, starting fall, uh, Jean is going to be joining uh, the London Business School as assistant professor. Uh, so Jean is going to tell us about some of their recent work in mixed integer optimization. So please take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for organizing this seminar. So uh, this is joint work from my advisor Dimitris and Ryan Corey Wright, a fellow PhD student at MIT, about a unified approach for mixed integer optimization nonlinear formulations and scalable algorithms. So to motivate a little bit the work, I would like to go through some of the uh, kind of textbook examples, I would say, of mixed integer optimization and uh, mixed integer modeling. So the, the first of such example maybe is like, you know, very standard facility location problem where you have to decide whether or not to build a facility ZI would be then a binary variable and decide also on the amount to ship from facility I to customer J or node J. So that will end up in mixed integer linear program where you try to minimize the costs. So uh, construction costs C uh, transpose Z and also uh, transportation costs capital C transpose X under some constraints, which are kind of the usual one typically for all facility I, you, the amount you produce at cannot exceed capacity, right? So the sum of xijs has to be at most ui. And also for all nodes, you want to satisfy demand. So the amount you ship to node j uh, has to be equal to the demand at that node. And typically here, because we, want, we don't want to ship some amount or produce some amount uh, from a facility that was not constructed, we have what we call big M constraints that say that xij have to be less than ui times zi. So that uh, typically enforces uh, xij to be zero whenever zi is zero. Another example uh, is, for example, portfolio selection, where we have those kind, same kind of structure, right? So uh, here zi would be a binary variable telling you in which security you want to invest, and xi would be the fraction of the portfolio that you invest in this facility, in the security. So here the objective is often something like kind of a more quadratic objective that uh, relates to the value at risk of your portfolio. And the constraints typically are that you have to invest all your portfolio. So you want the sum of the X size to sum up to one. You also want maybe to invest in a limited amount of securities. So the sum of the ZIs have to be at most K. And again, uh, because you have this logical relationship between the amount you invest and whether or not you invest, you typically have X size that has to be less uh, or equal than uh, to ZI. Uh, finally, uh, another example uh, of problems that share again the same structure is network design example. So here uh, the question is you have a graph and you want to construct some edges. So the binary decision would be whether or not to construct the edge. Um, and then once you would have like the complete graph with new edges, you kind of solve kind of a, a transport or a min cost flow kind of problem and XE here would be the flow that goes through edge E. So typically again, mixed integer linear objective, if you assume a linear transportation cost uh, and you have constraints that typically are the, the standard flow conservation, conservation constraints, so AX, AX equals B, plus uh, maybe some big M constraints again, uh, XE less than UE times ZE, so the UE uh, can be capacities on the, uh, on the edges and those constraints you need uh, to enforce the relationship uh, that no flow can go through an edge that has not been constructed. So all of these problems uh, have something you know, very basic in common is that they all mixed integer optimization problems. They involve a binary variable Z and a continuous variable X and those two are related through big game constraints. Right. And actually, when you look at, you know, uh, textbooks 
in introduction to mixed integer optimization or mixed integer modeling, typically those problems, that's the way the problems are formulated with those constraints, those big M constraints in the default formulation. So, uh, you know, what, what do I have against big M constraints? What do I keep, you know, uh, emphasizing that, that part and that structure in those problems? Well, the main issue with big M constraints is finding the right value of M. Because typically, if M is too low, uh, then the problem might be infeasible. But if M is very high, then you get very poor relaxation bounds. You also end up in numerical issues and convergence of the algorithm might be pretty intractable, slow, or even numerically unstable. So you really want to be in kind of a sweet spot where you have uh, M high enough so that the problem is feasible and you don't bias the problem too much but not too high, so you don't run into numerical issues. And so big M constraints in practice can inhibit the scalability of your numerical solvers. So there's a need here to kind of think about the alternatives that we could have for big M constraints and maybe, um, yeah, and then would allow a better scalability and easier tuning of those parameters. So that's exactly the, the goal of this work, is kind of revisit uh, and kind of formulate the big M constraints in a new way that allows for alternatives to be designed and analyzed. So typically here, what we're gonna consider is a general mixed integer optimization problem. So Z again is a binary variable, X is a continuous one. You minimize a linear function of the binary, C transpose Z, and then a convex function of the continuous variable, that is G transpose X plus omega of X. So here we decompose the objective into a convex plus a regularizer. And uh, I will come in more details about what the regularizer is and what I mean by that. Most importantly here, uh, we have those logical constraints. So uh, this structure that we had in all, the, in all the examples I gave you in introduction, the continuous variable XI has to be zero whenever zi uh, is zero. So this is, I think you, you'll be convinced of that, a fairly general class of problems. Uh, it includes the three examples I gave you in introduction, network design, portfolio selection, facility location. It includes a lot of also of examples in uh, machine learning uh, and machine learning under sparsity, so sparse uh, regression classification. Uh, sparse PCA also can be fit into to the, this framework. And many other more and I think you you'll all be convinced of that uh, binary quadratic optimization uh, unit commitment and so on uh, actually you can prove that um, the union of uh, polyhedral constraint uh, polytopes is actually a special case also of those uh, 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 fits also in the class so it's a, a fairly general class of problems so for this class of problem uh, we have a uh, our contributions can be divided in two categories. On the modeling side, the first thing we would like to, to argue is kind of decompose the big M constraints that are again, like kind of by default in those problems. So absolute value of X less than M times Z and decompose them into two elements. Uh, one element is a hard constraint on X, absolute value of X less than M. And the other element is the logical constraint, x equals zero if z equals zero, okay? And the first part, so the, the bound on x is what I'm gonna call the regularizer. So once you agree with me on the fact that you can view big M in this way, namely as this interaction between a logical constraint and a regularization, then the natural question to ask is, is there other things to be done? Are there other regularization that we can consider and that, could, that are viable alternatives to the big M. So here in this work, we consider two potential alternatives. The first one is the big M constraint. So a hard constraint on the magnitude of X. The second one is a ridge regularization term, namely in the objective, <coughs> having a strongly quadratic term, okay? And to cope with the logical constraints, X equals zero if Z equals zero, we're simply gonna do it and account for it by having a nonlinear transformation of our variables, namely replacing X by X times Z whenever it appears in our problem. 
Our second type of contribution in this work is more on the algorithm side. So we show that you can reformulate then the, those problems as mix, max, uh, mixed integer saddle point problem. So mixed integer min max optimization problem that can be solved exactly with outer approximation. We also uh, study the Boolean relaxation of the problems and show that uh, by solving the relaxation and do a simple random rounding strategy, you can obtain provably near optimal solutions in polynomial time. And finally, on several numerical examples, we show uh, how our method scales and can improve upon uh, what's currently being done. Uh, both in terms of scalability and also sometimes quality of the solution found for the hardest instances. So the main uh, thing I would like to emphasize here again is, so this modeling choice that we have being between having a big M constraints or using rigid regularization. So to illustrate that, I would like to take the example of portfolio selection. So here again, kind of minimize value at risk of the portfolio, you want to invest all your portfolio, so some of the X size uh, is one, and you don't invest, uh, so the amount you invest is zero whenever you don't invent, invest in the security. So XI equals zero if ZI equals zero. So the thing most of us do when we have a problem of this kind is kind of start analyzing the constraints. And we see that the XI are not negative, we don't short sell. Uh, you invest everything, so the sum of the Xi's uh, equal one. So it means that each Xi individually is bounded by one. So there's a natural big M constraint here uh, by adding this and the logical constraint to say Xi has to be less than M times Zi with M equal one. But you see here is that if you take some other value of M, uh, it might not be a good idea. For example, here, if you take M less than K over N, well, the problem becomes infeasible because you need to invest all your portfolio and you don't want to invest in more than K securities. So you need M high enough. And as long as M is greater than one, then you see that adding big M constraints does not bias your objective. So exactly the behavior I was telling you in introduction, except that here it's a very special example. So I know the threshold value, right? I know the value below which I should not be. My problem would be infeasible. And I know that above one, I'm, I'm safe using big M constraints. But typically, I would like to uh, argue that we could do the same kind of reasoning for rich regularization. So namely here, in the objective, I have a quadratic term. And I could extract, since so sigma is a semi-definite uh, matrix, I could extract the diagonally dominant part and kind of extract a strongly quadratic term a natural rich term as well, one over two gamma plus the sum of the Xi square. Here, the good thing is, what, is that whatever the value of gamma, I didn't change the feasible set, right? I didn't, it's not a constraint, it's a soft penalty on Xi. So the problem remains feasible if my original problem was. The downside is that if, you know, for example, some of the eigenvalues of sigma are zeros and I added this rich term artificially, then whatever the value of gamma, even if gamma is very high, then the objective value will be biased, right? And as a result, the optimal X, so the optimal continuous solution would be biased as well. But what I would like to also to emphasize here is that the optimal discrete solution won't be changed if gamma is high enough because it's discrete, right? So there's only a finite amount of potential solutions. So clearly here to emphasize that those two, so either big M or rich impact the problem in the same way. I'm displaying here the portfolio profile of your investment when you vary M and vary gamma. So big M is on the left and uh, rich is on the right of the screen. So here you see for big M, what I told you, if M is small enough, infeasible, if M is high enough, the solution is constant. It doesn't change the optimal solution. But you can see what's, I think, more striking is how similar the two profiles are. Namely, when you change gamma, there are some breaking points where the securities you invest in uh, change. And otherwise, those are smooth profiles where just, it's just the amount you invest that change. So just the continuous solution and not the discrete one. 
and most importantly, for gamma very high and M very high, you end up with the same discrete solution. Okay. So I would really like here to emphasize and put really big M and rich regularization on the same kind of level uh, and as uh, potential alternatives to cope with those kind of logical constraints uh, in mixed integer optimization problem. So now the question is how, you know, how can we solve those kind of problems with either big M or rich and can we analyze this, class of, this general class of problem in the way that allows us to understand how each of those regularization impact the optimization problem? So to do that, we first we write the problem as just a minimization of a, the binary of a function f of z that is just the partial minimization with respect to x, the continuous variable, binary is being fixed. Okay. So with those notations, uh, you can prove that basically under some assumptions that tell you you can apply strong duality, f of z can be written as a maximization problem. A maximization problem, dual variable, we call it alpha. h of alpha is just a concave function that's simply some functional conjugate of g. So depending on the problem, then h would change. But most importantly, we have the final term, uh, the sum of zi times alpha star of alpha i. So that's an important term because first it's linear in z, so that would be very important in proving that f of z is convex. And also it only depends on the regularization. And you have here closed form expression depending on whether you use big M or you use rich regularization. So the proof of that theorem is just, you know, substituting xi by zi time xi and then some like duality derivations to end up with that. So a few comments on that result. So in this reformulation of f of z. First, uh, uh, an interesting observation is what happens if you don't regularize? So what happens if omega of x equals zero? Then you see that alpha star, so the, the, the thing that appears in the maximization would enforce alpha i, the dual variable to be zero whenever zi is not zero. So that's just kind of Slater's condition of the, of the logical constraint. So that's interesting because here you see that with this in mind, really regularization is just a, a way to impose those constraints in a soft way. So instead of having hard constraints, alpha equals zero, whenever zi is non-zero, you have it in a soft way, in soft penalty way in the objective by multiplying zi by alpha star of alpha. The second remark is that with this formulation, it's easy to show that f of z is convex and also Lipschitz continuous, and that the Lipschitz constant directly depends on m and gamma. That's why we, I refer to omega as a regularization term, because it actually, it's not making the problem convex, but it's making the problem smooth. Namely, f of z, it, it, it allows f of z to have bounded subgradients, which it doesn't have in the absence of uh, regularization. And again, here we see that big M and Ridge really play the same role. So really impact the objective function in uh, the same exact same way. On a side note, for Ridge regularization, if you take the bidual of that also, it's also nice to see that you recover perspective formulations and perspective cuts from Fengioni and Gentile. So it's also, I think, very interesting to see the connection here between the two and see how uh, provide maybe a new perspective on, uh, on those kinds of, uh, of techniques. Also, because I mentioned in the introduction, we study the Boolean relaxation of it. And so you can show that if you solve the Boolean relaxation and round it, then you obtain epsilon optimal solution. Uh, here, again, the interesting thing here is that our results depend explicitly on M and gamma exactly in the same way. So, uh, again, emphasizing the similarities in the role that rich regularization and big M play and impact the optimization problem. So enough for the theory, just in terms of algorithms. So we want to solve this min-max optimization problem, uh, minimization of a discrete, maximization of a continuous. 
So typically what we do is we apply an outer approximation on f of z. So approximating f of z, which is convex by piecewise linear uh, convex function, implemented with lazy callbacks. Uh, one started with the Boolean relaxation, as I said, to have a, a good uh, lower bound and also uh, rounding, uh, random rounding for the upper bound. Uh, what I would like to emphasize here is why do we think these methods work and why this framework is relevant? So I think there are three main reasons for uh, this, re this outer, general outer approximation procedure to work. Uh, three reasons that kind of echo also other analysis uh, in, for modern Bender's decomposition, especially work by Fischetti and co-authors. So the first ingre ingredient is being able to generate cuts, so computing f of z in a very efficient way. So for that, whenever you have sparse uh, incumbent solution z, uh, that helps a lot because it efficient, effectively reduces uh, the dimensionality of the problem you need to solve to compute f of z. Also, that's where choosing the regularization in a proper way is important because, uh, because big M changes the feasible set and because ridge changes the objective and value and makes it quadratic, well, one regularization might be better suited for your problem at hand, namely provide closed form solution or exploiting some kind of problem structure. Second ingredient is having a cut selection rule if you have degenerate cuts in the branch and cut uh, algorithm. And that is, I would say, a very good advantage of using bridge regularization because the bridge regularization makes the objective strongly convex. Uh, you won't have degeneracies of the cut, at least on the active uh, indices, which kind of by design breaks degeneracy uh, compared to big M. And finally, uh, third ingredient is having a rich root node analysis. And that's what we get by studying the Boolean relaxation and also uh, all the random randings happening at the root node. So uh, to conclude, I would like to show you a, a few numerical results. So uh, the first set of results are on network design. So those are instances of a multi-commodity network design with quadratic transportation cost. Uh, so here you need to solve a QP. To, to generate the cuts, uh, basically. And here I'm showing you the best solution found, so the lower the better, uh, after an hour, because none of those instances could be solved uh, to optimality. And those are correspond to the unregularized objective value. So uh, even if you add some uh, regularization to compute the optimal solution, uh, the, the, the objective values here uh, do not depend on the regularization you got. And so here, two, three observations to be made. The first one is that this outer approximation procedure uh, scales better than just putting the, the problem to cplex naively. And that's kind of intuitive because that's what the composition algorithms uh, were built for, right? Uh, improve scalability on large scale instances. A second thing is that we uh, generally obtain better solutions using bridge regularization. And in this case, I think it's because it's a network flow problem. There's a natural network structure and not imposing big M, namely not adding constraints is a good way to uh, preserve those, uh, this nice structure and speed up the way to generate, uh, to generate the cuts. Third observation is that general improvement. We see an improvement uh, in the solution found from 5% up to almost 40% for some of the hardest instances. Uh, we also look uh, in this paper, but also in a uh, dedicated paper on sparse portfolio instances. And here are just a few uh, sizes of big, largest sizes we're able to solve using this technique, again, with rich regularization. Uh, we also looked at sparse uh, classification and regression. Here, it's interesting to see that uh, adding ridge regularization is kind of natural because it's also something that has been done in machine learning to reduce overfitting. Um, and so there's kind of both, like rich regularization is actually in this setting maybe more natural than a big M as something to try. Uh, and finally, uh, another example we looked at recently was a sparse principal component analysis. So here, 
it actually required quite some work on our side to formulate this as a mixed integer SDP problem. And uh, the nice thing is that actually we show that you can compute the objective value and subgradients in the cut generation problem without solving any SDP, which makes the approach very appealing in this case. Um, and uh, you have reference to the paper if you're interested in it. Uh, and there's many more numerical examples in the paper, uh, binary quadratic unit commitment, uh, among others. So to conclude, uh, briefly, uh, I think the main takeaway of this talk is really don't feel married to big M. And I think that's something we, we don't, maybe not teach enough, at least in, in graduate level classes. Uh, and that actually nonlinear reformulation, and this, this perspective of nonlinear reformulation and regularization opens the door to other techniques such as rich regularization that can be numerically very efficient uh, depending on your, on your problem. Uh, so the main thing is strong duality here that we leverage to derive this saddle point reformulation and obtain uh, an exact outer approximations procedure with uh, to altogether a ge very generic approach and very uh, generic numerical strategy that uh, is very scalable and as we can see uh, can provide significant improvement on some hard and large scale mixed integer optimization problems. So thank you very much for joining and uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions, if any. Okay, thanks, Jean, for the nice talk. Uh, we do have time for some public questions. Um, there's one from John Chinnick here. Do you typically get the same set of non-zero continuous variables from each technique? So, yeah, uh, so uh, typically, yes. Typically, yes, um, and it seems, like this, the, the way you can view it is like any way what you do is constraining the magnitude of X, uh, either as a soft or a hard penalty. So that's why you could think that they should be, for each gamma, there should be an N where the set, the discrete variable, so the, the set of non-zero would be, would be the same. Uh, so I have a, a quick question about the, the way you implemented this. So you said uh, lazy callbacks. So is that, did you do that with uh, CPLEX? Is it relatively straightforward to um, get the algorithm you designed working with, a, with an existing solver? Yeah, so we did that with uh, CPLEX and Eurobi actually. So, I mean, it's fairly straightforward as long as, uh, you know, lazy callbacks are implemented mm -hmm. in the solver. Uh, and, uh, we, we, when we implemented it, it was just, was, so everything was implemented in Jump, in Julia. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I think version, version 19 was not great for handling callbacks, but uh, uh, 20 onwards is now uh, very straightforward and generic. So the code you would get for at least lazy callbacks won't depend, won't be solver specific. So you could actually also mm -hmm. play with the solvers. Mm -hmm. Cool. There's a couple of questions here. Um, one from Michael Winkler, have you tried using indicator constraints instead of the big M formulation? So um, effectively, you know, like I, the nonlinear kind of reformulation kind of effectively um, is very similar to indicator constraints. Uh, we haven't tried explicitly. I think that the nice thing with having regularization is that it gives you a, an extra parameter maybe to tune. So uh, you have kind of for, you know, very small M, it's easy to solve very large M, it's hard to solve. So uh, I think that's a nice, I think, appeal of having a, a regularization instead of indicator constraints in this case, but uh, we haven't tried now. Okay, um, question from Jim. Uh, in many models, the big M value should be different for different constraints. Yeah. Is there an analog for the regularization approach? Yeah, uh, exactly the same. So. Uh, the rich term, you know, is you can, it's decomposable over the coordinates. So it's, you know, one over two gamma times xi square. But of course, gamma could be a gamma i that depends on the, on the, uh, on the coordinate and you would get uh, potentially tighter bounds. Same way for begin, as for begin, yeah. Okay, and we keep getting more questions. Uh, so there was one from John Chinnick. Any advantage to using one technique to find the continuous non-zeros? and then including only those in the other technique to sort of solve for their final values. So I would say, especially for example, for the, 
once you have a Z, computing F of Z is pretty straightforward, no matter the regularization, and especially you know, without any regularization. So I would say if you're in a case where you introduce regularization artificially, then you should probably say uh, the procedure you described to compute you know, the final cost. Mm -hmm. um, then it depends. Yeah, I would say it depends on how much you care about, you modified your original problem and uh, you care about the bound gap. Because you know, if you really care about the bound gap and you introduce rich regularization, for example, to find a good solution, you might be interested in then putting that solution back to the big M regularized problem to get the bound gap on the big M regularized problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, uh, Wei Jun. Uh, I, I recommend you take the question to the breakout room uh, yeah, in a minute. Sure. Uh, and thanks again, uh, Jean and Timo, for the for the nice talks. And thanks everybody for sticking around. Thank you.